clients ask me about this. Menopause is not a disease. Society has made us feel that it's a condition to be treated. That can be tied with a lot of mental health challenges, anxiety, depression, just a, a sense of loss of self. We are going to demystify menopause. Why do you feel like it's important for women to have a deep understanding of and this is an important question. Most women think of testosterone as a hormone that is manifest mainly by men, but women produce testosterone, and it's probably underrated. It can impact women's sex drive, it can impact uh, women's mood, but if, you, if you're afraid of having those conversations, then you're not looking out for yourself. All right, so today we have a very important conversation, a conversation that we haven't really talked about on the podcast up until this point. So I'm joined by Dr. Daphne Bascom, and we are going to be talking about menopause. So I'd love to, first of all, thank you for being here. Thank you. Thank Appreciate you for being it. part of this conversation. And I'd love to jump in and start by just defining what is menopause. Uh, well, first of all, thank you for opening the space to have this conversation because it's a very important one. As I think we've heard in the news, menopause is having a moment, but I think within the Vegan Superhero Academy, we really know why it's important. Let me start by defining perimenopause and then menopause. So peri is a prefix that means around. And so the time before menopause is perimenopause. And perimenopause can start in your 30s, it can last anywhere from 4 to 12 years, but it's that period in your life when your estrogen levels are changing. They can go high, they can go low, and that accounts for a lot of the varying symptoms that women experience during those perimenopausal years. And it can be very erratic, which is very disconcerting to many women. Menopause is actually a point in time so menopause is defined as you have not had a menstrual period for 12 months. And so, you, you know, the, the clock starts and you count and every now and again, the clock resets, but you have to go for that full 12 months before you are defined as being in, in menopause. And that's regardless of hormone test. You still need to go 12 months. What happens in menopause is the in perimenopause, a lot of the symptomatology results from variations in estrogen levels. At menopause, there's a very sharp decline in estrogen, and that's why women start to experience more extreme forms of some of the symptoms they had in perimenopause. The night sweats, the brain fog, um, you, you may see some weight gain. A lot of those are attributable to hormonal changes, not just estrogen, and we can go into that in a little bit more detail, but that is the definition of perimenopause, those years leading up to when you stop menstruating for 12 months, you stop menstruating, and then you have postmenopause. Postmenopause is life. Um, I think people think that you go to menopause and then what, but the rest of your life is postmenopause, and some of those symptoms may remit, but some of them may persist long-term. Thank you for defining what menopause is. I think lots of people maybe don't fully understand the difference between perimenopause and menopause. And I actually did not know that you can be in perimenopause for up to 12 years. I knew it could be a few years. I did not know that it could be over a decade. So that's quite, quite a range. It is, yes. There's also situations where there are women who have premature menopause, and then there are also circumstances where, due to surgical intervention, women may have surgically induced menopause. So you could be a woman in her 30s or 20s who loses her ovaries or for some other reason that is not natural, you can go into menopause early. So it's there's a whole gamut of what may trigger those declines in estrogen, either natural or induced by some type of intervention. Yeah. Let's go into the hormonal changes in more detail. So could you outline the primary hormonal changes that women experience through perimenopause and menopause? Yes. And I'll, I'll touch on three main hormones. Let's talk about estrogen, progesterone, and testosterone. Um, and everyone knows what those hormones are, but I really want to frame why they're important in menopause at a high level. So estrogen is the hormone that is responsible for a lot of the 
experiential changes that women manifest during perimenopause and menopause. So estrogen is released by the ovaries. During menopause, with the decline in estrogen, you start to experience symptoms such as the hot flashes, the night sweats, the brain fog, the insulin resistance that may occur as it re related to declines in estrogen. You may also have some um, changes in your cardiovascular system that are related to the loss of the cardioprotective effects of estrogen. So estrogen is the main hormone that changes during the time of menopause. Progesterone is another hormone, and progesterone is normally in the normal menstrual cycle of a woman. Progesterone is released around the time of ovulation. But during menopause, you're no longer ovulating, so your ovaries are no longer releasing eggs, which means your progesterone also declines. And those changes in progesterone are maybe attributed to some of the sleep disturbances that women sometimes experience during menopause. Um, they may also be responsible for some of the other symptoms that are kind of this long laundry list of what women may experience during menopause. And I want to make sure, um, you know, for all the women that are listening that I've articulated some of the most common symptoms, but if you actually survey women and you catalog how broad their symptoms may be, there's, there's, it's multifactorial and it's multi-system. And so it's easy sometimes to diminish a or, or under appreciate what women may be experiencing when they describe the symptoms that they're having to their healthcare provider during the menopause transition. The other hormone is testosterone. And I know most women think of testosterone as a hormone that is manifest mainly by men, but women produce testosterone. And it's probably underrated in terms of its role for, you know, as it as testosterone levels changes, it can impact women's sex drive, it can impact um, women's mood. Women may not often be asked or measured in terms of their testosterone levels, but if you're looking at kind of the, the trinity of hormones that change during menopause, estrogen, progesterone, and testosterone are kind of the big three. And women should not ignore testosterone levels because potentially intervention could help minimize some of the symptoms they experience. Yeah. A few years ago, I read... Uh, I forget exactly where I heard it the first time, but women have actually more testosterone than estrogen, which I had no idea about. And actually, <laughs> and actually, I'm not sure all women know that as well. Yeah. So that's also an important hormone for all the reasons you just mentioned. It is. And it's probably not a fact. I mean, Leif, to be honest with you, I don't think I understood menopause um, not based on what I learned in, in medical school, because no one ever talked about it. And I will, you know, I'll also share because I've had clients ask me about this. That was I was this always my life? You know, the, here I am at fifty seven. Was I always a healthy, fit vegan? And the answer is no. So when I started my journey in my forties, you know, leading into perimenopause, it was a hot mess. So I completely can sympathize with women who, one, no one ever talked about it. You may have talked about it with your grandmom or your mom, and but mo for the most part, it was hush-hush. And it's not something that was openly discussed either from the perspective of training clinicians how to have conversations with women or from family members saying, here was my, what my experience was. It seems like that's really changing though, which is which is positive. It is. So I'm glad that that's becoming a more public conversation. So could you explain how menopause uh, impacts a woman's metabolic health? Yes. Uh, and this is an important question because metabolic health, I think, is core to our health, our long-term health and longevity. So um, Let's look at this in two or three major buckets. First, as I mentioned before, the changes in estrogen that occur during menopause also have an impact on a woman's insulin sensitivity. 
insulin is the hormone that is released by the pancreas. It is part of that lock and key mechanism that allows blood sugar, you know, the, sh the glucose that's in your blood to get into your cells. And when you become insulin resistant or when you become less insulin sensitive, you may have problems regulating your blood glucose. And what that means for women is it may predispose you to prediabetes. It may mean that you are more prone to um, increasing your visceral fat. It may mean that some of the modifications you make in an attempt to lose weight, you may feel are not as effective, but part of that may be related to changes in insulin sensitivity that occur during the menopause transition. And it's important one because metabolic health also relates to your cardiovascular health. So it's very important for women to understand the importance of the hormonal changes that occur during menopause and the impact on their metabolic health. And metabolic health, I'm going to touch on that in terms of your overall metabolism, the impact on your bone health, and the impact on your cardiovascular health. So the one of the things that women often experience during this time is the stubborn kind of belly fat that tends to accumulate. And one of the common occurrences during menopause is that the decline in estrogen is associated with an insulin resistance. And that insulin resistance may predispose women to being at higher risk for type 2 diabetes. It may be correlated with increases in visceral fat, and it may have some overall impacts on your metabolism that may make you more prone to gaining weight, which is frustrating for women. The other thing that the changes in estrogen are correlated with are changes in your bone health. And this is something that women commonly know. And we've talked about this um, at our vegan superhero retreats where it's important to continue to stimulate your bones through, whether it's through weight-bearing exercise, whether it's through high-intensity interval training. You want to stimulate the osteoblast to continue to make bone so that they can counter the osteoclasts, which tend to break down the bone. So women during menopause, frequently they're concerned about osteopenia or osteoporosis, and some of those changes in the increased risk of osteopenia, osteoporosis are associated with those changes in hormones. And then the other significant impact of, especially the decline in estrogen, is on cardiovascular health. And Estrogen is cardioprotective. And so many women, and you know, we talk a lot about this in our um, master classes, you need to be very careful in the menopausal, in those years postmenopause, to make sure that you're managing your nutrition, that you have had a good assessment of your lipid profile. So we always talk about know your numbers because some of the protection that you had in those childbearing years that you had from the estrogen are now gone, which again, we are now equalizing our risk of succumbing to heart attacks and stroke and other cardiovascular diseases that are typically more common in men, but our risk has increased over time. Could you touch on some of the central uh, tips that you would have for a woman who is navigating perimenopause and menopause uh, in terms of nutrition, what movement looks like, just kind of some general general tips. Absolutely. Um, and I'm going to use the framework that I, I think is very appropriate, which is the three M's. So from a perspective of nutrition, eat plant-based. If you're listening today and you're already primarily plant-based, kudos to you. If you're not, I would strongly advocate that you consider adding more plants to your plate. In particular, there are um, there's great evidence, and a lot of it coming out of the Barnard Medical Center, that adding soybeans to a woman's diet during perimenopause and menopause can help minimize some of the symptoms that are manifest, especially the hot flashes. So it's a half a cup of soybeans, not the edamame. You want to get the soybeans. You want to cook them. You want to eat them. You can add them to your salad. You can have them in a side. You can add them to your chili. 
But there are data to suggest that some of those phytoestrogens are effective at reducing your symptoms, especially the hot flashes. So from a nutrition perspective, whole food plant-based, the best extent possible. I don't I I really encourage women to fuel your body. So when I come across women who are calorie cutting to the extent that they're potentially impacting their metabolism, that's not good. You you still have to feed your body. And so eating a eating the rainbow is still going to be healthy. You don't need to avoid carbs. Carbs are not the enemy. Making sure that you're getting recommended amounts of protein. And we will talk about that in detail on another podcast. You know, how much protein do women need during menopause? And that's the first M, meals. Movement is key. Um, I would definitely recommend anyone who's listening to, if you're not moving today, you need to become active. Uh, There's a couple of reasons that's important. One, your type 2 muscle fibers are also going to be at risk of diminishing postmenopause. And those are your fast twitch fibers. Those are the fibers that you can stimulate by doing high intensity interval training. You can, if you're jump roping, if you're just doing things that are stop and start, not the, you know, I don't want to encourage people to get on the treadmill and just walk for hours. You need to have a combination of steady state cardio. It's kind of your type two cardio, but you need to interject some of that higher intensity interval training. I also want women to lift. Um, I think that, and I know we've talked about this, women are not going to get big by lifting. It doesn't happen. And I would actually say that you need to start lifting in your 30s because you're priming your body, you're growing that musculature, you're growing your bone strength, but your muscle is metabolically active. And the more muscle you have, one, you're increasing your insulin sensitivity. So you're be able to take up the sugars from your bloodstream and reduce the risk that you're going to become, you know, reducing your risk for type 2 diabetes or metabolic syndrome. Two, your muscle mask and the, the stress that you place on your muscles and your bone are also going to set you up to be stronger longer, which means you're going to be at decreased risk for falls. If you do fall, you'll be able to catch yourself because you do have those type 2 fibers. So you need to move. And that movement needs to be a mixture of cardiovascular activity and resistance training. Probably the other thing I would really recommend that women start to seek is some way of focusing on mindset and stress management. Um, And the mindset piece is related to some of the symptoms that I hear, whether it's the brain fog or whether it's the sense of purpose or the sense of self or the loss of confidence as you're you know, you can be agelessly vital, um, but you need to have confidence that you are that person and that you can manifest that whether you're in your 40s or in your 80s. But part of that is how you think of yourself and removing that limiting belief that menopause means you're getting older. It doesn't. It It's just another phase of life. And then the stress management, I think, is important because our 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 sense of self, I think, changes during this time, but also our responsibilities at work, our responsibilities in our family. And so being able to manage that stress and then how um, stress hormones also interact with the other hormonal changes, a whole nother conversation, but an important one that we need to have. Great. Yeah. Thank you for all those tips. I just want to highlight on the the lifting side or resistance training side, one, it's never too late. So I know you said, hey, it's ideal to start earlier. It's never too late. To set yourself up for success, but it's never too late to jump into a new resistance training program. And another uh, thing I'd like to highlight is the fact that it doesn't need to be in a gym. It doesn't need to be just weights. And actually, I know you do a lot of training just with body weight, with bands, and you can do that on the go. So you want to speak to that at all? Absolutely. And thank you for bringing that up. Um, it is never too late. If you're if you're listening today and you're 80, it's not too late and you should start. Um, again, going back to my personal experience, I didn't get gymified until I was in my 40s. 
Um, and so again, not some may have said that was late, but it was an, a great opportunity. And I think most of my strength gains and muscular gains occurred post forty. So it's possible. Um, I would also. I I feel very strong, and I think the pandemic helped emphasize that you don't need a gym to train. Um, If you have a body, we can give you a workout that will help you, one, keep your bones strong, help you grow muscle, and all you need is maybe four to six feet of space and a great body weight program, and you can train. Uh, If you want to add bands to that or you want to add, I love having people walk outdoors and you can do dips on a bench, you can do push-ups on a bench. You just need to be creative or have a great coach who can help you find creative ways to use your body as a great resistance. Yeah, love that. Um, also want to touch on what what you mentioned regarding the effects of soybeans on hot flashes. So I read in uh, How Not to Age, Dr. Greger's new book, he talks about the fact that um, about 85% of American and European women experience hot flashes versus 15% of Japanese women who experience hot flashes. And in fact, in Japanese, they don't even have a word for hot flash uh, or hot flashes. So, and uh, there's been a lot of research done in that area and they've determined that it's really comes down to the consumption of soy, which is um, obviously pretty predominant in a, a more Japanese diet. It is. And I mean, the other thing I think is helpful, and it ties back to the podcast you recently released about breaking down the soy myths. I, I do think there are still some women and even some healthcare professionals that have a fear of soy um, because there is not a full understanding of actually some of the protective effects that the phytoestrogens can have. So part of it is getting the information out there. And I think podcasts like the one you released are helpful. Studies like the Barnard Medical Center are releasing are helpful. But that difference that we see in different cultures, it's a sign that, you know, we should be adding more soybeans to our diet. Yeah, love that. So why, why do you feel like it's important for women to have a deep understanding of, uh, a deep understanding and appreciation of menopause? Um, I think it's important because one, menopause is not a disease. Um, I really feel that society has made us feel that it's a condition to be treated rather than a natural part of life and aging. And part of that understanding is being able to empower you to make well-informed decisions about your health as you grow older. So there's this, the, the education and empowerment are important because understanding menopause will allow you to have a conversation with your healthcare team around, what do I need to do now? What do I need to understand now? And how do I protect my longevity um, so that I can be healthy and vital and up until my 90s. But if you if you're afraid of having those conversations or if your healthcare team isn't comfortable having those conversations, then you're not looking out for yourself. I also think it's important from the perspective of going back to mindset and confidence. Um, I think a lot of times, again, there's this perspective that, you, you hit menopause and you fall off the cliff. Um, you become less important to society. You become less important in the workspace. You become less important to your family. And that, that can be tied with a lot of mental health challenges that women experience during this time, whether it's anxiety, depression, a combination, just a, a sense of loss of self. And so you need to understand that these changes are normal what you're experiencing is normal. It shouldn't be thought of as a disease, but you need to be able to understand that, you know, this is not abnormal and have conversations and seek help if needed. The other reason I think it's vitally important is going back to longevity. Um, I, I really think that 
by understanding the changes that occur during menopause and the, your need to protect your metabolic health, protect your bone health, protect your cardiovascular health, and protect your mental health, are they're all within your ability to have an impact on as long as you understand that these are things you need to be concerned about. And if you're not, then you're not able to look out for yourself as best possible. Yeah, thank you for sharing all that. Uh, very well said and, and really important. So we are launching a brand new program within the Vegan Superhero Academy. Uh, the Vegan Superhero Academy is our one-on-one -on -one online coaching program for vegans to help them look and feel their best. And we are launching a new program, Menopause Mastery, and you are going to be heading that. Uh, so you are the instructor for that course. Could you give us a sneak peek into Menopause Mastery? What does that look like for women who join? I am so excited about this program. Um, so Menopause Mastery will launch in January 2024. It's a 10-week program that where we will take women through a... Um, again, I want... My goal is to educate them, to empower them, and to allow them to engage in their own health and longevity. So we'll cover things from going, taking a deeper dive into the conversations we're having today around what is menopause? Um, what are the symptoms? What are the hormones involved? We'll talk about sleep. We'll talk about stress. We'll talk about weight management. We'll talk about physical activity, movement. How do you move more during menopause? Uh, we'll bring in things. I mean, the curriculum we've laid out is, I, I think, really exciting because we've taken we are going to demystify menopause and we're going to give the women who participate in this course a toolkit to go forward and really be vital in this amazing period of their life. Um, but the key part is investing in themselves, being part of mastering menopause. And I think that uh, it's going to empower them to really take charge of this, the next 50 to 60 years of their life. Love that. Yeah. If you are interested in learning more about our new program, Menopause Mastery, you can click the link in the description or head to vegansuperheroacademy.com forward slash menopause. So we have all the details laid out there and we actually have a really uh, special promotion going on for the first women who join that program. So you can go to that page and learn all the details. Um, Daphne, really appreciate your time. Thank you Thank so you. much for educating us on some of the fundamentals regarding menopause. I look forward to having more of these conversations. This is a really important topic and you're just a wealth of information in this area. So thank you so much for your time. Thanks. And I look forward to our next conversation. Thank you for the opportunity. Menopause isn't an end. It's a powerful beginning. I'm Dr. Daphne Baskin. I'm 57 years young and I am in the best shape of my life. What if menopause could be the start of your best years yet? That's why we created Menopause Mastery. We've combined expert knowledge with real life experiences to create a program that adapts to your life, not the other way around. Our goal is to empower you with the knowledge and habits you need to thrive through menopause and beyond. Menopause Mastery is more than a program. It's a commitment to yourself. As a dedicated vegan physician and health and fitness coach, I'm here to support and lead you through this remarkable phase of life. I would tell women in their 40s, 50s, and beyond who feel that their best years are behind them, that their best years are yet to come, and that by understanding how to navigate perimenopause and menopause, that they can actually achieve the life, the body, and the dreams that they desire and that they deserve. So when I hit 40, um, life was not great. I was in the process of getting divorced, probably drinking a case of wine a week, um, living off of potato chips. If I didn't do something different, nothing was going to get better as I got older. I want women like me, whether they're in their 30s or in their 70s, to realize that you have it within you to change. 